Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my to the conference. I hope you all are safe and having a good time listening to these amazing speakers. Thank you for tuning in. My today's topic is about introduction to social engineering, where we'll be discussing the different types of social engineering attacks and how to protect against them. I'm Diksha Shekhar, and here is a small introduction about me. I'm an industrial management graduate. I graduated in September 2020. I got myself system engineer gig, and which I'll be joining in another week. Other than that, I am inter interested in everything about technology. I write blogs, and I also got my CH certificate last year. Here is the agenda for our today's talk. Today, we'll be learning about what social engineering is, who are the targets, the different types of targets of targets of social engineering attacks, how a victim's behavior can be manipulated for the attacker's gain, then anatomy of a scam call. Here, we'll discuss how a scam is strategically planned and executed for money. Lastly, we'll talk about countermeasures to keep away from th these attacks. So what is social engineering? Here is this nice internet definition about social engineering and also a cute picture of a doggo saying the 101 of hacking is social engineering. I mean, it's not wrong because it is, unlike other attacks, doesn't make any use of special tools, but only psychological manipulation. Yes, social engineering is a con or a scam technique of tricking people to give you confidential information. When I say confidential information, it doesn't necessarily have to be something top secret. It can be something simple and yet effective like date of birth, your pet's name, where you live, where you work, and so on. The most common targets of social engineering attacks are technical support executives, help desk professionals. Their job is to provide support to their customers and to maintain good customer relationship with the company. A hacker could impersonate as a client, asking for advice or to help troubleshoot a certain problem and could take advantage of the situation. And it is their job and they ought to be polite and nice and helpful. Some executives fall for the spray out of lack of awareness and just by believing that they are doing their job. Next common targets are job seekers. They upload their resumes on various job portals. Their primary information can be easily accessed by hackers. With this data, hackers could plan and execute their social engineering attack on them. After that comes older people who are not much familiar with technology, which makes them an easy target for the attackers. Lastly, it is said that the success of a social engineering attack depends on the confidence of the attacker and the gullibility of the victim. So the next attack could be on me, you, or anyone, basically end users. There are no fixed number of social engineering attacks. The list goes on depending on how smart and creative the attacker is. I've listed a few attacks here and separated them in two different groups. First group is about is technical or computer-based attacks, which include phishing, pop-up phishing, spamming. Next group is non-technical or human-based attack, which includes impersonation, shoulder surfing, dumpster diving, and wishing. The first attack under our technical attacks is email phishing or simply phishing. As the name suggests, phishing is a cyber attack that is carried out via mail. A basic phishing attack attempts to trick the target into doing what the scammer wants. In today's world, kids and teenagers don't listen to their parents. But then how do you expect adults to pay attention to a stranger and give them their information? Here is a picture of a doggo doing tricks because his promise treat later. What about humans? Same logic. You promise them something and they fall for the trap. So how do this email phishing work? 
The goal is to entice the victim just enough so they'll share their login details and other sensitive data. Their emails are designed to deceive and trick recipients to take action immediately. Firstly, the attacker will craft an email with a catchy subject and the body of the mail could be anything as follows. Like they might say that they've noticed a suspicious activity or a login attempt from your account. Or they could claim that there is a problem with your account or some payment information. They could say that they want you to confirm some personal information like here in this first picture. They could include a fake invoice of an item that you never purchased. And they might ask you to click a link to make the payment, or they might provide another link saying, if you have not ordered this, you could just cancel your order by clicking this link. Or they could just say that you're eligible to register for a government refund. The possibilities are endless. They could be anything. This so when what happens when the, when the customer or the victim clicks on the link? It is redirected to a fake website, which looks exactly like the real website. While being redirected, a malicious script activates in the background to hijack the user's session cookie. The next attack is about pop-ups. What is a pop-up? It is a GUI display which are generated by websites to provide additional information or guidance to the users. Here's pictures of pop-ups, which look absolutely normal, but nothing harmful in this. Here is something that is asking for your you to sign into your YouTube account, and the second one asking you to register for the Nike's newsletters to get their exclusive offers. See, nothing harmful in that. But what about these? In many cases, cyber criminals infect legitimate websites with malicious code that causes these pop-up messages to appear when people visit them. These fake warnings will be typically about security of their computer or of their device. After that, they prompt the user to download a fix, which is actually a malware disguised as an antivirus application. Trust me, if there were actually problems, some issues with your computer, a legitimate IT support will not ask you to fix it using a pop-up message. Next one is about spamming. Spamming is a variant of spam that exploits instant messaging platforms to flood spam across the networks. Attackers use bots to harvest instant messaging IDs and spread spam. Our next group is about non-technical attacks. The first one is impersonation. Impersonation is basically pretending to be someone. A classic example of impersonation could be two twin brothers taking each other's place to play pranks on the friends or family. Websites are the first point of contact for consumers. Using these websites, one can not only review companies' products and services, but also can place their order. The impersonation attack targets reputed organizations spoofing their domain. Criminals will copy the content of the organization's legitimate domain, like logo, brand, layout of the site, the color to misguide people to use their fake website in order to steal credentials or to distribute malware. Another popular impersonation attack is social media, fake social media profile, or commonly known as catfishing. Next one is shoulder surfing. Being nosy is considered rude, but what if Looking over someone's shoulder could get you money. Hold that thought. Let me tell you what shoulder surfing is. It is using direct observation techniques like looking over someone's shoulder to get information other than that, binoculars, video cameras, and other optical devices are also used in shoulder surfing. 
This simple technique could nab valuable information such as username, passwords, ATM pins, credit card numbers, and so on. And this information can be used for financial gains. ATMs are common target location. Other than that, shoulder surfing is generally generally takes place at a crowded local transport, bank, ATM queue, supermarket, and etc. Next one is dumpster diving. Dumpster diving is searching trash for useful information. Like the say, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Surprisingly, a lot of personal information is discarded without destruction, such as old hard drives, CD, DVDs, test printouts that have IP addresses on it, sticky notes with username or passwords. Information can be recovered from drives that have been improperly formatted or erased. In medical records, like here in the second picture, in other personal documents, that could contain personally identifiable information or PII, which must be destroyed or the organization could be exposed to breaches or worse, potential fines. This picture of what all information you could get from dumpster diving, like phone numbers, names, passwords, access codes, network diagrams, credit card receipts, and so on. Last one is phishing. Phishing is a cybercrime that uses the phone to steal personal confidential information from victims. Cybercriminals use social engineering tactics to convince victims to give up private information such as account numbers, passwords, OTPs, or other financial details. Scammers might say that your account has been compromised by claiming to represent your bank and offer you to help you. Using threats, strong and forceful language, or they might sound convincing just to make their victims feel as though they have no other option than to provide the information that is asked by them. Coronavirus outbreak has generated brand new opportunities for the scammers to get creative with their attacks. This slide will see the anatomy of a scam call. In today's social media era, it is easy to get primary information of a person. The person who's calling you could just confirm your details by doing just a small footprinting. Then they could impersonate as an authority figure claiming that they're from your bank or from a reputed company, job portals, could be anything. Then they would build trust by talking to you, giving you more information about why they've called you, this and that. Next, computers usually work in binary. Either it is zero or one, true or false, but that is not the case with humans. In between a yes and no, there is a maybe, I guess, I don't know, a lot of options. The attackers or scammers intention is to get you from that maybe phase to a yes phase. They can't take a no, to an on, no as an answer. After a lot of talking and building trust, they'll convince you to pay some amount. If you show some skepticism or you're skeptical about paying or not, then they'll pressurize you. They'll tell you, they'll create a false sense of emergency saying this has to be done within now or within the next 10 minutes or you could lose your money, you could lose your information or they could tell that your computer has been infected with virus. If you don't do what I say, you could lose all your data. They will scare you and this might push you to doing something that the attackers want you to do. How to identify a scam call? If you feel that the person is reading from a script or is not able to answer your specific questions or is asking irrelevant personal questions or seems unprofessional or 
i had a person who called me and spoke addressed me as dear and that is that was my first red flag and your biggest red flag could be when the person asks you to pay money no job portals or companies will ask you to pay money in exchange of interview or a job so don't pay money here is a cause and effect diagram let's think about why people are becoming victims of social engineering attack i mean social engineering attack has is not something recent it has been there for a while now but why are still people why are still people falling for it because it is working almost every damn time people are still falling for it let's see the behaviors or emotions that leads to a social engineering attack like lack of awareness i mean they might not know that all these attacks exist or greediness they want that lottery money that has come in their mail or they might fear of losing their data their next is trust or sheer ignorance or human natural desire to be helpful all these emotions might be can be manipulated and can lead to social engineering attack what are the nat- natural behaviors of humans that can be used against them in uh if an attacker is talking to you in person he might be very keen and absurd in nature he might appreciate you he'll provide that external validation if you're feeling left out he might make you feel welcomed or included in a group if you're trying to be that know it all person then he could boost your ego he could do anything just to gain your trust and take information from you uh, the other emotions that are included is our fear guilt panic all this could be manipulated and used against you so what are the countermeasures that you can take to stay away from these attacks first one is don't click that link don't click that damn link it could be about if you find it suspicious don't click it there are browser extensions that could alert you about malicious t- sites find out and use them a hacker could misspell a word like ie instead of ei or ei instead of ie and make it look like a legit site or a legit domain replacing rn with m or m with rn might look like they are very hard to notice then protect your atm pin codes by maintaining social distance always watch out for people who are trying to shoulder surf use contactless payments digitize digitalize use fingerprints or biometric readers to minimize the need to enter a passcode use privacy screen protector that can help you limit the field of view to your screen but that doesn't mean the attacker can't notice your keystrokes but kind of does the job then locking waste bins just to protect your trash from dumpster diving and shredding the confidential information using caller id apps that will alert you from spam calls always be cautious always be skeptical don't trust anyone so the key take away from this presentation uh, or what i like to call summary uh, is that we learn about the types of social engineering attacks what happens and how to identify a scam call the cause and effect diagram or popularly known as fishbone diagram of the social engineering attack human behaviors that are used against them for manipulation and lastly countermeasures to protect from attacks these are the references i used for this talk thank you i'll leave
I'm open to question answers. First of all, before ending my talk, I want to thank the organizers, especially Skelly and Atomic Nikos. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really glad. I'm very humbled. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to present with us. This was such a fantastic talk. And you have a couple questions, Atomic, if you'd like to start us off with those. I can, yes. Um, right, so uh, imagine now you, you're uh, quite a um, experienced social engineer, but uh, imagine you are a, uh, you were a beginner social engineer. What tips would you uh, give to a beginner social engineer? So social engineer, I guess it needs, first of all, you want people to trust you with something from me, for, with their sensitive information. I mean, you want, if you want people to give them, sorry, just give me a minute. No. You're good. To begin with, social engineers, you need to have a lot of patience. A lot of grown-up adults don't open up that easily. You need to know what triggers them? Uh, what? How can you be friends with this person? Or if that is difficult, then how could? Or if you could get access to their phone, how could you do that? You could just ask, "Hey, I don't have a charge on my phone. Uh, do you mind if I use your phone?" Or if you find, if you notice that the other person's phone doesn't have charge, you could ask, uh, offer help, and I'll I can get the charger, and you could copy contents from the person's phone. Alrighty, and you can start with this. Those are some really good tips there. Um, and how could someone make this a career? Like, if someone wants to be a professional social engineer, how would they be able to do that? Is there like a specific cert that you can get? Is there any classes you can do? There are a couple of books you can read by Kevin Mitnick. And there is a very good old book about how to influence people and be friends with. I am not sure about the name. It, mm -hmm. Something starts with that. The number of books that you can start reading but regarding the career, I am not sure. I am not the person to answer. Mm -hmm. okay. Alrighty. We've had a, uh, did we go over the tools and tips? Nope. No? Okay, well, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yet another question has come up. Um, so do you have any favorite tools or tips uh, that you would use in social engineering? So not necessarily to prevent it, but to actually do it. To do a social engineer. Yeah, to social engineer near someone. Do you have any tools that you like using or uh, any tips that something that works for you? Uh, what I personally feel is there quite a few OSIT uh, things that you could do, uh, like just to plan, get some information. There's social media like LinkedIn. I mean, you could, a person would have put his whole career on LinkedIn. You could get some information on that from that. Okay. I think that works for a, on the surface level. Mm -hmm. I I don't have any personal favorite. Alrighty. Good to know. Thank you so much for presenting with us. We really appreciate it. It was fantastic and lots of uh, receptive and good feedback.